As a young man who traveled the world and intended to do so for the foreseeable future, he faced a sudden, life-changing diagnosis. This diagnosis and the journey that followed has not defeated him, but it's increased his strength and zest for life. You know, just not taking every day for granted that this is something that can happen to virtually anybody, not just like someone who's in kind of the twilight of their life. That's kidney transplant recipient Aaron Sims. I'm Monica Fox, Senior Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and your host for this edition of The Journey Continues. Aaron joins us for this episode to share how he has returned to a full life after a traumatic diagnosis. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Monica. How are you? Great. Thanks. How'd your journey with chronic kidney disease begin? Well, kind of pretty sporadic. I mean, I was traveling internationally for a little bit and uh, was kind of like one thing after another. Wasn't feeling well. Started to get uh, some swollen joints here and there. And finally woke up one morning with a blood clot. Doctors uh, assured me that the blood clot was from some of the extensive flying that I had been doing and uh, gave me some Eliquis. So... About four months into the Eliquis, the blood clot kind of subsided, but a lot of other symptoms kind of continued. And my mother, obviously being a mother, urged me to go get a full checkup, go get a full checkup. So went to the clinic, had blood work, urine work done. Sure enough, they said, we have a big problem and uh, my kidneys were not functioning. And that was, I want to say like November, 2018. And how'd you feel when you got that diagnosis? I didn't quite understand the magnitude of kidneys not working. I think my initial response was, I got a couple of trips coming up. Can I get enough to last me until I get back? Wow. (laughs) So you were just going to keep on moving. Yes. I've I've had some health concerns in the past and, you know, it kind of seemed like the major things were like surgeries and everything else was like, I just take a medicine or a pack and you'll be fine. So I think my initial reaction was that, you know, give me some meds and I'll I'll be all right. See you next week. So what what treatments did they actually offer you at that time? You know, probably in the first couple of months, there wasn't really much they could do. I just joined a pretty good regimen, a cocktail of prednisone and a couple other meds, really trying to reduce the regression of uh, my kidney function. I was also diagnosed with lupus, which was the primary reason that my kidney function had begun to subside. And so how these treatments, the medication, how that impact your life? Were you able to just go on on your trips that you had planned or how did it impact you at that time? No, I was sidelined. They told me, don't get on a plane. Don't stay in a car for more than two or three hours at a time. It really changed. I had to eat pretty significantly different. I had handfuls of meds that I had to take. And yeah, I was, I was pretty restricted. Life, life changed pretty dramatically in, in a short period of time. Did that impact you psychologically? How'd you deal with it? Changed me my mind psychologically because I was an entrepreneur at the time. And, um, you know, I traveled around to see clients and had lots of friends in lots of different places. I think at that moment I had been to about 30 countries. And so I had plans to go to South America for four months. And, you know, being told that you can't get on a plane, <laughs> it doesn't make you feel pretty good about your, uh, your independence and being able to do the things you want. I know that must have been devastating. So what have you learned so far that's helped you manage your chronic kidney disease? Well, the kidney disease, I think, was like I say, was a derivative of the lupus. And after a transplant, after a living donor transplant, I should say, hopefully the the initial diagnosis of the lupus kind of gets burned out. So I've been uh, researching and I've, I've joined to uh, a kidney diet. I have a dietitian who sends me things on certain foods to try to and try not to eat. I and mean, really just getting enough rest and drinking plenty of water. That's great. And so you just mentioned having a transplant, which you did. And congratulations on that. Thank you. But let's talk about how the transplant workup process was. You know, it was just a lot of blood work and training, changing up medicines you know, as far as getting ready for that, uh, I remember lots of folks had to go and get their own testing to see if I was going to be available. 
to match with them or if, they, or if their kidneys were, would potentially be a match for me. I think probably four months or so was the time frame it took once we finally decided that, hey, you know what, like this is going in the wrong direction pretty quickly. So we need to start taking some action. So you really were in need of a living donor. And how did you feel about searching for a living donor? Well, like many things in this country, there's just a lot of false information around what's going on with healthcare. And uh, I was pretty terrified. You know, the first couple of things I looked at basically made it seem like if you were on a cadaver kidney list, then you're probably going to die without getting one. There wasn't a lot of information available around the transplant process or identifying a donor and or even the supplemental donor program where basically someone can donate on your behalf, even if it's not their kidney that you receive. So I think my, my first kind of reaction was like doom and gloom. I just, you know, took myself to try to do some research and understand what I was facing. Well, that's great that you did the research and, you know, found out what you needed to know uh, so that you could move forward. It is daunting information that they give you about waiting on the list. It's not a bright picture that they paint there. So I'm glad you were able to get the information you needed to keep moving forward. And so tell me about your donation. You received a donation from a living donor? I did. My younger brother, Marcus, uh, was adamant that he was going to be the one. I believe I had about 32 or 33 people actually volunteer. I don't know who many folks actually went through the process, but it, it's not a quick process for having a living donor get tested and see how the match process goes. But yeah, my younger brother, Marcus, he's about 15 months or so younger than me. We look alike. We're about the same stature. So we were pretty confident that it was going to be a good match. Well, that's awesome. And so... I'm sure he doesn't let you uh, live it down either, huh? Oh, you know what? He's, he's a pretty gracious guy and he doesn't bring it up too often. I mean, we had an anniversary here a few months back and, and we talked about it and whatever and kind of compared scars, but it uh, doesn't really come up in everyday conversation that much. I see. And how's um, how many years have you been living with your transplant? A little over three years. It was uh, February 2021. Congratulations. That's awesome. And so how's life post-transplant for you? So kind of getting back into the groove of things, working full time and uh, maintaining a pretty social calendar. Obviously, things have shifted. You know, I've significantly cut back on the drinking, cut back on the uh, the fried foods. Haven't really been able to get as active as I'd like. You know, the main concern with after a, a kidney transplant is a uh, hernia. So I've really, really reduced the amount of uh, like weightlifting and, and physical activity I do. But it's been good feel like I can lead a semi-normal life. Well, that kind of leads to my next question, which I was going to ask, were you able to return to normal activities and, you know, how much, how much are you able to do? Yeah. I mean, I would say the majority of folks that I interact with from a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, if they weren't tracking me or they didn't know me six years ago and followed what I'd been through, probably wouldn't know that, uh, that I had. And what about travel? Have you gone back to your traveling? I have. I have. I've been to about six countries uh, since my transplant and uh, anxious to get back on the road and get a few more. But, you know, taking it slow and just making sure I take a moderate approach to the new life that I've, I've been given and, you know, respect the confines of, you know, what things that can be rational. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how's your family impacted by your kidney disease and lupus? So my father actually had lupus and it didn't affect him as much. He already kind of had a history of heart attacks and they uh, continued to diagnose him with pneumonia. They finally came back and said it was lupus. And so I had heard the term before, but really didn't know too much about what it was. I thought it was like an old person's disease. And um, since my diagnosis with lupus and also needed a kidney transplant, I think it's really brought awareness to my brothers on what they can be doing with their diets and activity uh, and reducing stress on, you know, just not taking every day for granted that this is something that can happen to virtually anybody, not just like someone who's in kind of the twilights of their life. Yeah, that makes sense. And what's one thing on your bucket list that you're determined to cross off? I think probably between continuing to travel and also, you know, get married and have kids would be great. I was kind of towards the later stage, 
in relationships and so on. And I think, you know, sitting on the sidelines for five or six years kind of took a toll and, uh, you know, getting into my early forties and, you know, thinking about being a father someday and, and not knowing how the impact of, you know, potentially needing a new kidney in 18 to 22 years, how that's going to impact, you know, myself and, you know, my wife or my my spouse and, you know, our kids. So, but that's something I still think that I aspire to. Like I said, you know, come from a pretty big family, it's really cherished and adored by my parents. And I think that's something I'd like an opportunity to do someday for myself. So I think that's awesome. And I think uh, you definitely deserve that to be married and have a family. And I know that's that's definitely in the future for you. And I hope that I'll be invited to the wedding. <laughs> Anybody who knows what I've been through and can uh, empathize with will certainly be there to celebrate with me. Yes, for sure. And so what would you say to others who are facing similar challenges that you have faced? You know, I'd say that uh, stay positive. Uh, The outlook is typically, you know, much better than what we think. And a lot of times all the information isn't before you before you start to feel a certain way. Everything in life is a, a balance and a combination between logic and emotion and just doing the diligence and understanding like what your specific situation looks like. Talk to a couple of different doctors. I know that I saw two or three nephrologists for a cell down who I was going to be working with. You know, take the, the time to dedicate yourself to understanding. I, I didn't even really know what my kidneys did for me. I think that in America, we have a, a huge problem of arrogance and ignorance where everybody thinks they know everything, but nobody really knows anything. And so before issues come too highly on your plate, right? Like let's understand more about our anatomy and the things that work for us and the things that are necessary and how we take care of them. Preventative care is, it can go so much further, I think in this country than always trying to uh, play patchwork and, and fix things after they go wrong. So keep a positive attitude and be proactive about what you're doing every day for your life and to main, maintain your health. That's great advice. Thank you for that. So you've been through a lot of health care and I'm sure you've seen many providers. So I wonder what's something you wish that healthcare providers understood more about the patient experience? I think healthcare providers can probably do a little bit of a better job of helping people find resources on their own to look up, to understand what their situation might be for themselves, and also take a proactive approach towards preventative medicine but then also delivering information with a side of empathy and understanding like how some of these changes can impact the individuals and restrictions that they may be facing going forward. Awesome. And how's your brother doing after transplant, after donating to you? How's his health? Marcus is doing great. He's uh, certainly more active than I am. He's always been, you know, uh, more active than I am football and basketball and he works out and he's on the gun range diving under cars and shooting targets and stuff like that. He's got a little girl that he takes out and is pretty active with her. So I'd say life is uh, pretty much back to normal for him. Well, that's great to know and um, great for others to hear because giving a gift of a kidney is a wonderful thing to do. And um, we certainly appreciate Marcus for the gift that he gave to you. Amen to that. Thank you so much. It's been awesome sharing your story. I'm so grateful to Aaron for sharing his story with us. If you're struggling to balance life and kidney disease, surrounding yourself with a community can be helpful. At NKFI, we have patient programs and networking opportunities. To find out more, go to nkfi.org. I'm Monica Fox, and this is The journey continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at the Kidney Foundation. That's why at the end of each episode, we offer a health tip. Here's today's nutrition tip about calcium. Calcium is a mineral that is essential to bones and teeth with 99% of the calcium in our body stored in them. Our bones are constantly being broken down and rebuilt and we use the stored calcium in our body to do this process. Our nerves, heart, and the ability to clot blood all use calcium to do their work as well. As we age, we start to lose the amount of calcium stored in our body. 
In women, as estrogen levels decline with age, calcium absorption can also decline. Calcium is rich in yogurt, milk, fortified dairy alternatives like soy milk and almond milk, sardines and salmon with bones, cheese, tofu, green leafy vegetables like broccoli, turnip leaves, kale, fortified breakfast cereals, fortified juices, nuts and seeds, legumes and grains, cornmeal and corn tortillas. Calcium is better absorbed by your body if you eat a food with vitamin D in it as well. So milk fortified with vitamin D allows you to better absorb the calcium in milk. Adults aged 19 years or older need 1,000 milligrams a day of calcium, and women over the age of 51 need 1,200 milligrams per day. Eating three servings of dairy foods a day can help you meet that goal. If you have chronic kidney disease, you may have to limit the amount of dairy-rich foods per day. Talk with your kidney doctor to know how much calcium a day is right for you. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Press, a registered dietitian nutritionist.